Well, it's a pleasure to have you here, Dr. Anton Popov. Um, uh, it's a pleasure also that you have accepted to have this conversation uh, around your research trajectory and uh, more specifically around your latest uh, project, uh, chief project. Uh, chief uh, project is a project, an Horizon 2020 project that deals with uh, young uh, people with culture, identities, um, also about uh, exclusion and inclusion. And uh, it, uh, it, uh, there are many countries involved and also Spain. Uh, here uh, we participate at the Universita, Universitat Pompeu Fabra in, with both departments of communication and political and social sciences. Um, I, I would like you to explain us a little bit more about uh, this project and also how it is related to your uh, research trajectory, how you stand for uh, such a project, such a huge project. Also. Um, thank you very much, Roger, for first of all inviting and uh, giving this opportunity to talk about project and uh, also to see Barcelona and uh, to meet with our colleagues who are involved in the project to meet with you again. It's always um, um, inspiring to meet uh, other researchers and talk about uh, past and maybe future projects. So as for the um, CHIEF, CHIEF is um, an acronym, first of all. It stands for Cultural Heritage and Identities of Europe's Future. And um, in a way, the idea of the project um, emerged from um, my previous research with young people um, in Europe, across European countries. Um, and more specifically, I was involved in the project which called My Place, and you were also part of this project, um, where I, we were looking at um, political um, participation of young people, and more specifically trying to link this political participation with um, historical memories with the kind of memory in general. So being involved in this project, but also being interested in general in memory and in history, in cultural memory, being also um, social anthropologist by training, I always want to do something which would uh, look at young people and their cultural uh, practice, their way of engaging with the cultural heritage. So CHIEF is an attempt to address, uh, let's say, this issue. Because when people talk about cultural heritage, um, when research is done on cultural heritage, it's very often looked at um, uh, kind of um, from the perspective of the uh, uh, conservationist uh, approach, uh, or maybe from the critical heritage uh, studies approach. But it's rarely addressed the issue of young people and how young people are involved with cultural heritage. Um, moreover, this project is uh, the response to the particular call by uh, European Commission, which is part of the Horizon 2020 program, as you mentioned. The call was on um, enhancing, how we can enhance cultural literacy of uh, young Europeans. And um, again, I probably quite opportunistically with colleagues from uh, Slovakia, from Croatia, we, when we were kind of thinking about the uh, bid with them, we quite opportunistically decided to bring our interest in the cultural heritage and young people to this uh, call. And call was, um, the, the bid was, the, for the project was developed in a way um, counterintuitively to the uh, to, to the uh, call uh, because we were taking um, the approach that rather than being uh, developed cultural literacy in young people we have to recognize that young people have their own um, understanding of culture it's based on, let's say, the um, anthropological understanding of culture as uh, ideas and values which are enacted and uh, embodied in everyday life, as or as Catherine very said, as a meaningful world. Yeah. 
So we all have culture, basically. Human beings are born in expectation of culture. Um, therefore, um, cultural literacy, as it understood, for example, by people like Hirsch, as a um, certain cultural competencies which need to be developed in order to be successful in, uh, in society, we um, recognize or we rather uh, criticize this approach as being uh, top down and being uh, uh, kind of developed uh, from the uncritically taking uh, the uh, elitist understanding of culture. So we uh, try to engage critically with this through our project. And we looked, of course, at uh, in the project at various uh, educational environments of young people, cultural socialization schools, but also non-formal organizations uh, with a cultural agenda and informal like families, um, peer groups. And we did this in nine countries. Uh, very different uh, yeah. countries, no? The, the, that, was, that was also challenging no? uh, to involve countries such as India or Georgia or... Yes, we, um, it, it was very ambitious. We uh, took countries which are part of, let's say, the project Europe in political sense. Um, and, uh, but b even within the Europe, the kind of countries, posi the countries are positioned differently in terms of the, uh, this project Europe. So we took the old European countries like uh, Spain, let's say Germany, UK, Britain, but no, we, we also know that uh, uh, in the course of the project, the UK left European Union, for example, the, the body which um, kind of uh, represents Europe politically. We also um, brought into the project countries which are, let's say, in the, the, the new Europe, the countries with the socialist past, like Latvia, Slovakia, Croatia, and countries which are aspiring to be Europe, uh, like Georgia, for example, countries which have, um, um, let's say, quite ambiguous relationship with Europe, like Turkey being the European other. And of course, India was probably a bit, um, uh, some would say, maybe far stretching to bring the, uh, India into the project, which is about young Europeans. But we thought that, okay, what is Europe? Europe is a political and cultural construct. Mm -hmm. And very often, um, the European identity is constructed through the relationship with other. And through the history, India was this kind of other, the colonial other, post-colonial other. Mm -hmm. And now in the globalized world, uh, also uh, uh, kind of the other with whom Europe want to build some sort of relationship. So we thought that we need to bring this post-colonial perspective in, in our project and uh, involve uh, Indian colleagues and uh, this locality as well. It's it's clear that the, is a, it it has been an ambitious project and and it for sure it will be very difficult to answer this question. But what are what for 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 from your perspective what are the the main aspects that um, um, of this relationship between young people and culture in terms of um, what is what is specific of youth in their relation of culture? Well, of course we. we <laughs> Given that we have nine countries, you might expect that uh, in all these locations we can uh, talk specifically what constitutes, what represents for young people their kind of meaning of uh, culture and so on. But if I kind of uh, make a step back and say what I kind of mean by this, um, let's say, anthropological understanding of culture, how we try to um, approach and criticize the concept of cultural literacy. Um, so there is this tension between this kind of culture which we all have, which young people are socialized uh, through, let's say, family, through their env diverse environments, and uh, the institutional, institutional forms of culture which also kind of, um, in a way, uh, promoted through the 
concept of cultural literacy by the state or other institutions which are related to the to the state. So if we take this these two perspectives, then we can see the uh, certain tension between what uh, is recognized by the powerful actors or powerful stakeholders like uh, state itself or educational institution institutions or different kind of practitioners, the heritage institutions um, recognized as culture as heritage mm -hmm. and what is practiced by young people. Mm -hmm. And we can say that everywhere across all our countries we can see that ethno-national understanding of culture or link uh, linking culture to the ethno-national kind of differences uh, and peculiarities is present everywhere. Mm -hmm. And this is very interesting because at the same time we have we register the clear um, uh, recognition and references to the culture to cultural diversity across all countries as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the institutional level we can see discursive kind of um, uh, construction of cultural diversity as being at the core of uh, good practices. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, but what we also see that there is this uh, sometimes a lack of recognition of cultural practices, cultural knowledges and cultural references which young people have themselves mm -hmm. and which um, perhaps um, not the same what the institutions value as uh, cultural practices. So this we can we register everywhere in all countries. Then we also can see that uh, in terms, because project was also about um, intercultural dialogue. Mm -hmm. So how we can enhance the, um, let's say, more inclusive society, more culturally inclusive society um, in Europe, but also in, uh, in our countries. And we can say that, um, so the ethno, uh, national understanding of culture is not helpful in this case. So it's great. It's uh, it's uh, sometimes uh, counterproductive for the uh, cultural inclusivity discourse. At the same time, um, in each country, um, we can say that young people are socialized or they are exposed to cultural diversity in different ways, and they develop. Um, uh, more inclusivist uh, understanding and uh, attitudes in each country, um, which sometimes they say they kind of say that older generations is less inclusive than us. Um, this might be what actually in your research it was quite interesting that we uh, and you were involved in the quantitative the survey, including the uh, students in, uh, uh, in all nine countries, which demonstrates that irrespective of whatever, uh, whatever cultural practices young people were doing, um, if uh, these cultural practices has this, have this element of the uh, inclusivity, of uh, being uh, op openness mm -hmm. to cultural diversity, then young people would develop more inclusivist attitudes. Mm -hmm. Uh, but also we can see that gender plays quite important role also across all countries. Um, uh, we can say that uh, young females on average perhaps demonstrate a bit more openness to other cultures than uh, young men. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, question why it is the, the, the case. Maybe it is probably demonstrate that there is still kind of deep-rooted ways how the gender um, socialization impact on uh, in general social and cultural socialization of young people. Mm -hmm. Another interesting, uh, f because I was doing research in UK and for me kind of UK case a bit closer, mm -hmm. um, it's the role of uh, place, uh, ro ro role of kind of geography in um, making young people more or less 
open to other cultures. Mm -hmm. So in UK, we can uh, see that um, young people from um, urban, big urban centers, they were, which are characterized by cultural diversity, where they're exposed to cultural diversity, perhaps they demonstrate a bit more interest mm -hmm. in learning about our cultures. Uh, whereas their counterparts in rural areas, they would be much uh, uh, less uh, interested in uh, other cultures, but they also live in very homogeneous, predominantly white British surroundings mm -hmm. and so on. So also this kind of uh, the uh, geographical dimension is important. Um, coming back to issue of gender, so in India it's very interesting uh, findings demonstrate that um, together with kind of traditional uh, social hierarchies which link to caste system mm -hmm. or what I already mentioned, uh, the differences which are embedded in um, ethnic and national uh, differences in India, gender uh, is another line of inequalities there's with uh, young female experiencing much more kind of exclusion mm -hmm. in society than, uh, uh, than uh, their male counterparts. Again, this is, here we can say, uh, talk about the uh, intersectionality of many different um, aspects. So I'm not sure whether I could go, go. <laughs> Yes, of course. I yes. think that you, you have already mentioned, but um, uh, also taking into consideration your, your research trajectory, I think it's, it's very interesting to, to talk about the, the role of the past no? in, in shaping these cultural identities in these diverse societies no? and how um, this is recognized or not uh, in the inst cultural institutions and, and in, in the state. How, how would you, uh, uh, we are always dealing with this very complex uh, uh, sample of, of countries no? where, where there, there are a lot of differences between countries, but how would you say that um, this past is, is uh, shaping the, the experiences of young people in their cultural uh, interactions, let's say. Let's say that um, because I already mentioned that this ethno-national uh, kind of understanding of culture is so deeply rooted mm -hmm. uh, across all our countries for at the kind of institutional level understanding. And this affects not just a different educational settings, but it is also internalized by young people and their families. So very often um, when young people are socialized, let's say, into um, culturally socialized within their family, with their, with, within their families, they reproduce mnemonic culture. Mnemonic, the culture kind of which is the, the, the uh, cultural memories, historical memories, which are promoted by the state. They internalize this through the um, what we call the everyday nationalism, which is practiced in the families. So, for example, uh, celebrations, mm -hmm. uh, um, which might be the national holidays, as the time when the families are governing and the young people are taking part in this. They kind of internalize this and they, um, um, through this, they socialize also into the um, kind of this state led understanding of uh, of culture which is based on a certain vision of the past and the history. Um, but also it's interesting that how within their, again, talking about families, how they remember the, their fam familial past, mm -hmm. the past of their families, their familial memories is structured by this national narrative. Mm -hmm. So they will, they would often talk about um, their family history let's say, um, highlighting such uh, points which are important for the national memory or national history, like Second World War mm -hmm. in, in Britain. Or they will talk about, uh, again, uh, the, um, the whole narrative about guilt uh, and Holocaust in the German case, in Germany. Or, um, critical engagement with the socialist past in post-socialist countries, mm -hmm. or narratives about the former Yugoslavia again. So all this would be passed to the younger generation 
um, they might be critical about this. They might see, let's say, the older generation as being too socialist or too communist, for example, like in the case of Georgia or in the case, uh, in the case of uh, our Croatian uh, counterparts, they might be seeing the older generation as being too nationalist, being kind of uh, more um, divisive in terms of the, uh, the former enemies mm -hmm. uh, during the uh, homeland war in Croatia and so on. But uh, still it is something which structures how they would think about uh, um, themselves, uh, the present as well. What is also interesting that uh, at the same time some, well, how young people think about the past, the national past, their familial past, and also uh, the present issues, mm -hmm. this all interconnected. And it's interesting to look at what is absent there. So the German case is very telling in this case, because uh, in this respect, because young people there would be taught a lot about the uh, national socialism and uh, Second World War and Holocaust, but almost nothing about the colo uh, Germany colonial, colonial past and uh, about German, Germany being involved in uh, colonization of uh, Africa, for example. So then it comes, this matters, because when it comes to the issues of migration and refugee in Germany, then there is kind of uh, this lack of recognition of um, Germany being involved in uh, colonization. Uh, its imperial past is a uh, kind of impact on how um, migrants and refugees are seen and perhaps discriminated mm -hmm. in, in, in Germany. The same we can, um, in, in the case of UK, for example, there is, despite the fact that there is this discourse of the uh, cultural inclusivity, which I already mentioned, the cultural diversity, uh, the way how the past is presented and taught at schools, for example, mm -hmm. and through the um, uh, cultural heritage institution is very uh, British-centered. Mm -hmm. So, um, if we look at the curriculum, school curriculum, English, for example, one of the key subjects in the school, um, the teachers would try to, to teach uh, literature which, let's say, progressive, which would uh, raise the issue of the, let's say, the gender inequalities or uh, inequalities related to the sexuality and so on. But the literature on, which is, which the, the English literature, which would look at the countries and cultures outside Britain will be absent there, even in the schools where, in the uh, inner city schools where uh, maybe 90% of the student population would be from the migrant background coming from Asia or Africa, this perspective would be absent completely. Mm -hmm. And when we ask uh, teachers, so why you don't bring, because in UK schools they have this kind of window of possibility to kind of bring the some literature which would uh, uh, they have a bit of uh, flexibility there. Um, why wouldn't you bring the literature which would uh, talk uh, to the students, to their cultural background, mm -hmm. and so on. They would say, we are not teaching the uh, translated literature. But of course, there is a lot of literature um, written in English by authors who are their origin from, from Indian subcontinent, for example, or from Afghanistan and so on. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask you about that, about the, the analysis of the curricula, the, because I know that it has been done in each of these countries. As, as a way of uh, looking at, as, as you said, this ethno-nationalistic uh, understanding of culture, it has been internalized, no? but um, educational institutions and cultural institutions and the state in, in a broad sense has a role in, in, in transmitting this kind of, of vision of culture. And very briefly, what, what would you say that are the tips for, for the recommendations for, for public policies to, to uh, adopt a more inclusive uh, understanding of culture? Okay, if we talk about um, educational institutions, yeah? As I already said, that there is kind of this tension between 
uh, on the one hand, this uh, deeply rooted ethno-nationalist tradition in understanding of culture and cultural education, and on the other hand, this kind of uh, cultural recognition of cultural diversity and almost like public mission uh, uh, that um, ethnic minorities and uh, other cultures should be in included and should be recognized. Um, so there is tension between this. And when we we'll come to the uh, school curriculum, we can see clearly that um, although it is stated that schools are committed to, to support of cultural diversity, there is very little support given to teachers to develop this side of curriculum, which would speak to uh, this kind of, uh, uh, to, to recognition of the uh, cultural diversity pr present in the society. And given that teachers themselves very often are socialized in this rather ethno-nationalist understanding of culture, and without the additional resources to kind of develop the cultural diversity aspect, it's uh, this cultural diversity aspect remain uncovered. So one of the recommendations would be actually in terms of the school to bring more support to teachers, both in terms of the, um, let's say, freeing their, or restructuring their uh, workload, let's say, but also uh, in terms of the additional materials, which would help them develop the kind of cultural diversity inclusivist agenda in, um, in curriculum. Um, but of course, our, uh, in our project, we have very kind of strong uh, impact, policy impact element. We published, I think, um, four policy briefs um, at the international level, at national level. Um, and of course, one of the recommendations which we made is uh, more recognition should be given to the um, civil society organizations who are involved in um, cultural education uh, or which have the cultural education uh, agenda. Um, because we noticed, we noted that these organizations, they are uh, by nature more flexible. They're kind of very often the um, grassroots led. They are responding to the needs of the participants, and they can be more effective. They can more effectively address the needs of uh, um, young people or communities with with which they're working, and they do actually quite effective work. Um, so, if we compare, for example, charity-led theater and more institutionalized heritage side. Mm -hmm than young people like we did in the uh, like museum, yeah? like we did in, in, in UK. Young people would say that they don't really engage with, the, with cultural heritage in, in museum because they don't see a lot of interaction there. They don't see a lot of uh, uh, something which would talk to them. It's strange from, from, from them. Yeah, they also have strong association with school because they introduce to museums very often through school visits there. And they kind of, they, especially when they're coming the, to the age, but then they're growing, they see kind of this as a boring thing. But then if they engage with cultural material or the, with the history, with the past, through the performance mm -hmm. in, the art, uh, in, in, the, in the theater, the kind of youth theater settings, they were talk, uh, telling us that they're actually getting better understanding of um, uh, of of the issues, they actually perhaps uh, even develop better empathy mm -hmm. to people who are coming from different cultures. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the example. Uh, one of the examples. So we need perhaps uh, we recommend that state institutions, uh, state policies uh, recognize the role of uh, civil society in developing cultural literacy. And this would require also the changes perhaps in the fis fiscal policy. So directing more resources to um, civil society to develop uh, um, uh, this work and kind of uh, in developing the intercultural dialogue and cultural literacy in this kind of re recognition of the c cultural um, richness mm -hmm. which young people have and com which community have. 
uh, unfortunately, very often now, uh, we have quite a lot of, uh, again, I, here I can um, give you an example from UK, where we have uh, a number of um, civil society organizations, charity trusts or other organizations, grassroots organizations, which would be competing for very limited um, uh, resources, very limited funding, mm -hmm. which again, not, help, uh, not helpful at all. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I think we, we could be talking for hours uh, yes. <laughs> on the findings and uh, the questions that raise also the, the project. It has been a pleasure to share your thoughts with, with us and uh, hopefully we have more opportunities to, to, to discuss and to share projects. Thank you very much for, again, for giving me the opportunity to, to, to talk about Chief Project and a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you.